Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Kay Blankenship. I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor. I've been a counselor for over 20 some years. I've worked in higher ed. And I'm really excited that we have a great crowd tonight. And I'm really excited to be here to talk about this subject. All right. Um, part of my career, I've spent a good amount of time working with adolescents and working in suicide prevention. So by uh, having discussions and group meetings like we're doing tonight, we're able to do some things. All right. We can reduce the stigma of mental illness. We can start some dialogues. Right. We can address some of the myths of suicide. And hopefully we can make a difference in someone's life. Um, I'm not here, you know, we're going to talk about the movie 13 Reasons. I'm not here, I promise, to kind of bash the movie. I'm going to talk about some of the concerns from a mental health standpoint, but I think it's out there. Kids are watching it. So I think we have to seize on any opportunity we can to create an engaging dialogue. So that's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit um, about mental health in adolescents. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the concerns with the show, and hopefully talk a little bit about how to talk about the subject with kids, and then open it up to a question and answer period, okay? All right. Um, you know, I look back, in talking about suicide and working in this field for over 20 years, I think some things are changing. I think we're able to talk about it more, right? especially with the youth. Kids that I talk to, they're anxious and eager to talk about mental health. I think some of the adults in the world, it's a little harder to talk about. There's some of the stigma and myths that we've grown up with. So partly I'm going to challenge some of those tonight. Okay? Suicide is a difficult topic, right? And it's impacted all of us. And it's a difficult topic for a lot of reasons. One is the stigma attached to it, just even in the terminology. We use words like committed, completed suicide. And so actually, one of the things I want to talk about is the best practice and the new term is we use is died by suicide because it helps take out some of that stigma. So think about it, if we use the word committed, you commit a crime, right? You complete your homework, right? You complete your job. We don't want someone to complete ending their life, all right? So that's why we kind of take some of that out, all right? And also in doing this, I think there's some fears. So if we address some of the myths, I think that helps us talk about it. And, and I would say most of us have been touched by suicide. We've lost loved ones, family members, friends, colleagues, classmates, right? And none of us can really escape the loss because if you look at the world we live in and we think about we live in kind of a global world and we know everything that's going on and look at our entertainers when our musicians, our entertainers, someone like that dies by suicide, that impacts all of us, right? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about this and the first thing I wanna do is challenge some of the myths. Okay, one of the myths out there is that no one can stop a suicide. The reality is suicide is preventable, all right? And almost any positive action can help. So that ties into people's fears. We don't want to do something to make things worse, all right? So in reassuring people that any positive action can make a difference. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the research behind this. The other myth people often have is that you have to be a professional to be able to work with people. Absolutely not. Anybody can get involved. All right? And one of the workshops I offer is called QPR. It's Question, Persuade, Refer. And what that is, it's a gatekeeper training for suicide prevention. And it talks about some of the things like the warning signs of suicide, talks about symptoms of depression, and then it actually walks you through how to ask someone if they're thinking of hurting themselves. All right? So it makes you kind of comfortable talking about the subject. So if anyone is interested, we do have a sign-up sheet out there for a workshop I'm offering soon. All right. Another myth is that if I ask someone, I'm going to only make them angry, and I'm going to make them do it. This is one of the biggest ones, and I would say adults definitely um, embrace this myth. Okay, we're afraid. We don't want to talk about it. Research has shown just by bringing up the subject will reduce a person's anxiety, and that alone can make a difference for them. You also get people talking, and it reduces if someone has an impulsive act. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the triggers, especially with youth. And impulsivity is a big one, okay? All right, so this is one of the slides I use with the kids when I'm doing training, and I talk about talking about suicide helps. It doesn't hurt. It's okay, all right? Also a myth we have is that it's a sign of weakness. And I think about the 20 years of doing this. When I used to work with the older population, especially males, 
uh, years ago, I could not use the word anxiety. I couldn't ask, especially an older gentleman, a male, <laughs> how's your anxiety? Oh, well, not anxiety. What do you mean? I'm fine. What are you talking about? I'd have to talk in code. Do anyone want to guess what word I would use? Nervous. Yeah? No? Huh? Nervous. Nervous. We talk about your nerves. How are your nerves? I say that to adolescents today when I give talks and they laugh. I think that's the goofiest thing. Right? So I think we have come a long way. And, and what I really want to portray to people and kids is it really takes courage to ask for help. And when we talk about this movie, I'm even working with kids that sometimes it takes even greater courage to keep asking. Because <coughs> if you ask someone don't get the response you need or the support, it took a lot of courage to ask the first time, it takes even more, right? So what we want to do is, is condition people to talk about it. It's okay. Uh, this is one of the slides I use when I do workshops with kids. Okay? Asking for help is a sign of strength. Uh, I do kids. How many of you in here have a class that you didn't like in school? Okay. Were you willing to raise your hand and ask a question in that class? Ninth grade geometry. Oh my gosh. I'm lucky I'm here, right? So I ask kids why. Why were you guys afraid to ask a question? Somebody, anybody. You look stupid. You look stupid. You might embarrass yourself. You might be dumb, right? When I teach college, I talk to the college kids, and I say the only stupid question is the one you don't ask, especially when you're paying for this for your parents, right? Okay, so part of that is if we can't even ask a question in geometry class because we don't know what congruent triangles are, how are we going to talk about mental health, right? So I think we're coming along. So part of that is educating. All right, so why do kids like this? I wanted to ask them, why do you guys like the movie? And speaking to teenagers, guess what response I got? It was good. Okay, I had to work on my counseling skills. Can you tell me more? Tell me about good. What's good mean? Why? Right? Well, they liked it because it's like a mystery. It's mysterious. It has dramatic mu music. It's the way it's filmed. It's incredibly dramatic. Right? Um, some kids said I read the book. The book came out in 2007. So I wanted to see how the movie was. Okay? Some say it portrays teen life. We like stories about our lives. Um, others see themselves in it, or they see their friends, um, classmates. Some said, oh my god, this is such a cheesy drama. This is stupid. Okay, why? I had one youth tell me, seriously, the, the main character, Hannah, was being stalked, and so she set up a trap in her own house. So this student said, who would do that? That could have been some psychopath. Right? Okay. But other kids, and this is where I get concerned, they felt like they're living it. When they say, I can relate to Hannah, I know what she feels like, and then if I talk to them further, and I'll say things like, well, tell me, which, what's your philosophy about suicide? What do you think about it? Well, I think it's a choice. And if you have nothing to live for and you're a burden, it's your choice. You can do it. Okay. That's a concern. I'd much rather work with those kids there talking about that, oh, it was cheesy and dumb and the music was stupid. Right? Okay. Um, what does it portray? Your choice the clubs, the groups, you got the athletes, you got the popular kids, the not so popular kids, the outcasts. It's got everything. I mean, I don't know if they have rock and roll, but sex, drugs, rock and roll, violence. You know, there's slut shaming, there's risky behavior, not only sexual activity, but drinking and driving, wow, violence. But it doesn't have a lot of stuff about mental health, like depression. So I'll come to that in a little bit. But it gives us a glimpse of the world that teens live in. And one thing I think it really does a good job of showing is the importance that teens place on their relationships. It is the most important thing. When we look at the development of adolescence, this is a time where their teens become their support system, and they start to pull away from parents, right? And they start looking at their teens. And what we have found, did you know research has found that kids will take risks to protect these relationships with their own health and safety? There was a, a study done where they looked at adolescents who had been drinking and were going to get in a car. They would not take the keys from their friend who was driving, and they knew their friend was impaired. Why? Didn't want to hurt the relationship and upset the friend. So they would not only not take the keys from their friends, they would get in the car with them. Okay? Uh, the same researcher did a study, and this is great, so women in here and young women in here, think about this. Think about your shopping experience. So when we go shopping, we take our friends. At least I do, right? They did a study with girls, adolescents. They took their good friends shopping, and they said, how do I look? What do you think? Do you like it? Does it look good on me? Guess what they all said? Yeah, you sure. You look great. Yeah, I look like crap. You didn't look good. They would not tell their friends how bad they looked. Because why? They didn't want to hurt their feelings. 
So the moral of nothing else you get out of tonight is ladies don't take your best friend shopping. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The other thing too is teens will, we call it the code of silence. If you're a good friend and you really care about me, you, you have my back, you don't tell my stories. So this is one of the challenges I have as an educator working with these kids is that this is the one secret you do not keep. And I'll talk about this in a little bit more. The other thing this show has is bullying. Not only does it have physical abuse, but it has verbal abuse, and it shows the social and the cyber aspect. Um, social building, we're harming the reputation, we're trying to cause humiliation for someone. In cyber, we do it through text, images, rumors, and intimidation. And when we look at this, did you know that bullying doesn't stop it's when you get out of school? There's some studies that talk about bullying takes place, I'm trying to think of what I'm up to, but 70 or 80% takes place in the workplace for adults, okay? The other thing, it looks at some of the stressors. Think about the fast-paced, complex society we all live in, let alone teens trying to navigate this and grow up in it. Um, think about our media, our social media, the information we get is constant and immediate. I want, I'm going to date myself, and some of the people can come back in time with me, right? In my day, when I was a kid, if you want to know what was happening in the world, you caught one to three channels of primetime networks. You watched the evening news. If you missed it, maybe you got the 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock news. And if you missed that, you waited till the next morning to read the paper. Kids today don't even know what papers are, right? Okay. With the invention of CNN and 24-7 breaking news, I didn't know we had so much breaking news in the world, right? We live in this global environment, and we're seeing things as they happen real time. That means terrorist attacks, natural disasters, <coughs> campus shootings. If I say campus shootings, what is the first one that comes to mind for people? Columbine. Columbine. Do you know the first mass school shooting was in, I think, 1966 at a university in Texas? How come we don't know that? News. CNN wasn't around, maybe, right? So we didn't um, bombard it. So with that, having said that, there's going to be a positive and negative impact on our relationships and our interactions, but we can use it as a way to communicate with our youth. How many of you text teens? How many teens dot you at a text, right? They will text things that they don't necessarily want to talk, right? They will text. Apps are wonderful. How many have Find Me, um, Circle of Six? They're ways to keep track of your friends and each other, right? So think about kids. Uh, we send our kids off in the car, so I don't mind. I have two teenage dogs, right? So I would get mad at them because I want to know where they are at night. So what do I do? I call them, and they're driving. And what's the rule? No. Don't drive when, you know, don't be on the phone when you're driving. So what do I do? I get mad because they, what, didn't answer their phone, right? Then they do answer their phone, what do I do? What are you doing driving? You're answering the phone, right? So some of those apps are great. You know, the iPhone Find Me. You can actually see where your kids are. Oh, they're on their way home. It's a stormy night. Great. I can, I can wait. They're almost here, right? And also, when you think about the world we live in, what life is like, how do we interact and communicate with kids? You know, this is my trade. I'm supposedly um, paid for my ability to speak and listen, right? Well, I'm guilty of it myself. It wasn't too long ago that my daughter, we moved to a new community, new state. She was a junior in high school. Not a great time to transition to a new place, right? She came home, and it was the beginning of school. And it was a hectic, crazy kind of day. We were trying to watch the news, and she was talking on stop. Da, 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 da. And I looked at her and I said, could you stop? Stop, just, I don't want to watch this. There was some earth-shattering, 24-hour news-breaking thing on I had to see, right? And so my daughter, and my husband and I were sitting there together. I said, can you just stop? I, I just want to watch the news. Can you just... She took them out and shut out the TV. And I said, guess what? I'm new. I'm in a brand new school. I have no friends. I have no one to talk to. So you two are it. So get used to this. <laughs> right? Okay. So that was a little bit of an aha moment. Like I said, we're doing the best we can with what we have, right? Okay. So, when we live in this world, it presents, it, it presents many challenges, right? The information that's out there, when you mess up, think about, in my day when I messed up, it was kind of my immediate family and who my grandma talked to and maybe local neighborhood kids, right? You mess up, boy, everybody knows, thanks to social media. Good and bad, it stays around much longer. I work with college kids about, and, and with, you know, we think about Instagram and Twitter, oh, it'll just last a few seconds, it'll be gone. Not if someone screen captures that picture. It can stick around. I work with college kids, you know, about what you post. When you go for a job interview, there are times, there are kids I've worked with <coughs> lots of positions and internships, because that company said, will you pull up your Facebook? Show it to us. Oh, right, we don't think about it. Also, when we talk 
about cyber bullying. You know, in the good old days, if there were good old days, right? Kids could go home and escape bullying. That doesn't happen. In fact, <coughs> one of the things I recently read, 70% of cyber bullying and bullying takes place outside of school, right? So you can't really get away from it, all right? So it's also, there's a problem sometimes with that. Oftentimes parents, and there are things you can do to deal with cyberbullying. You know, you can get off the social media, take a break from it. Some parents will take the phone away and say, stop, you don't want, I don't want you watching this stuff. Don't be on it, don't read the comments. The problem sometimes, there's a caution because this is their support system. How do they communicate? Texting, right? Okay. Uh, there's some research done about, we're looking at our cell phones, especially for young adults and teens, a cell phone is considered an extension of self. All right, what does that mean? When I talk about a hotline, kids look at me, I might as well be talking about a landline. What do you mean your phone was connected to the wall and you can only go far as the cord, right? <laughs> they have crisis text lines, and I'll show you the number of one we use for suicide prevention crisis line. Um, but what they found on, if they have a crisis line, and young adults and kids are responding by texting, if that responder on that crisis line will say, okay, can we please switch to phone, I wanna talk, guess what happens? They will end that conversation. They don't want to. When they're talking about physical stuff and mental health stuff, interesting. The other thing, University of Missouri, I thought this was interesting. They did this with young adults and teens. And, and what they did was they had them complete a puzzle and they had their phones there. And they would not let the kids answer the phone. It's texting, beeping, their, their anxiety increased. Their, uh, their blood pressure went up, their heart rate increased, their anxiety level, and guess what? Their cognitive ability went down. The kids that they let check it oh, okay. and get back to whatever, <coughs> didn't have that impact. All right. And I would say this is happening to adults too. You know, think about how many of you, when's the last time somebody in here lost your phone, forgot your phone? Did you feel lost? Okay. All right, what else is going on? This is a time of transition, instability and insecurity. The peers are the primary support group. Um, they haven't, adolescents haven't developed physically completely yet, and they haven't developed mentally. And this is important. We used to believe that by the time you reached you know, late adolescence, your brain was mature. Your brain was hardwired, you were done. So you had a mature brain and an immature body. What we have found is that the prefrontal cortex, okay, that's the part of reason, logic, judgment, part that regulates your emotions, isn't fully developed till age 25 now. So when I talk with kids, you know, and think about this, go back to your, your own youth. Did you ever do anything stupid? Boy, did I. What did your parents say? I could hear my father. What did he say? What were you thinking? Well, you know what? I wasn't. <laughs> the prefrontal cortex. So I encourage youth to try that at home. I, you know, I tell them it's not going to work next time you get in trouble, but see how far it gets you, right? Um, but with that, you know, there's some things. So think about it. We let kids drive at 16, vote at 18, drink at 21. Uh, but they can't run a car until 25. So who knew the car rental agencies knew about adolescent mental health and development of the brain? Who knew? We should ask, right? Okay. But this brain maturity, that's really important because sometimes kids have not developed coping skills to deal with life stressors and what's going on, right? And guess what? Neither has their support system. So that can be kind of a dangerous event, right? Okay. There's also some pressures. There's pressures for kids to succeed today academically, socially, think about sports. Think about keeping up grades, getting those scholarships, getting the sports scholarships. When I would teach college, um, there are college students that put in over 40 hours a week on their sport to keep that scholarship to stay in school. So I don't know how they did it, right? In fact, college students, they're a high risk group for suicide. So that's something we're looking at. How do we reach these kids? How do we address them? And there's a pressure to fit in. Another myth, kind of I call it, is called the myth of youth. We have this belief that the adolescent years, they're the best time of your life, right? What do you have to be stressed out? You don't have a mortgage. You don't have a car, baby. Maybe you do, right? What's your problem? And the other is the phrase, you know, oh, it's just puppy love. You'll get over it. the relationships. Those right there, by having that, this is one of the concepts sometimes why kids have a hard time talking to adults, because we discount what they're feeling is very real to them, okay? All right. And also, I think that social media creates this pressure, what I call an obligation to perform. You have to keep up with this online image. Think of the whole world of selfies, okay? And I want to put out there the stress of prom, right? Prom is supposed to be a fun thing. I'm going to introduce you to the promposal. 
<laughs> so where are those spices? This is what people used to get engaged maybe a few years back, right? That I thought was a big deal. It is a big deal how you get asked to prom. And it's not because um, this person's going to declare their undying love and ask it in this wonderful grand gesture. It's because they need something to post, so it's got to be good. These are girls giving other girls proposals, boys, I don't know, boys to boys as much, groups to groups. It's not necessarily a romantic thing, right? It's got to be spectacular and big. And you got to get, and so think about it. So if you're a freshman in high school and you go to prom, you have four years of topping yourself. Right? There's pressure. And it's not so much the kids are doing it to show off, it's because they feel they have to. Well, what's yours look like? Really? Okay. So what didn't 13 Reasons portray? One of the things I want to talk about is the connection to mental health and suicide. I think that's a big one, and that's important. The other, I don't think it addressed some of the misses suicide effect, I think it kind of helped create one. All right? And it did not portray adults as supportive, helpful, or knowledgeable. That's a concern, because I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute, but I work really hard in trying to get kids to open up to adults. All right. So and to do this, I want to talk a little bit about adolescent mental health research. Prior to the 1990s, we didn't know much about adolescent mental health. We didn't know if kids had depression, anxiety, mental health concerns, chronic mental illness, right? In fact, we kind of believed that myth. You're a kid. What do you have to be worried about? Nothing wrong with you, right? All right. It wasn't until Dr. David Schaffer at Columbia University started looking at this. And he was one of the first to find out that, yes, kids do experience mental health issues, and they do die by suicide. For many of us in the field, it was quite shocking. No one had really talked about it, but dead. So he found 90% of youth died by suicide, suffered from a treatable mental illness. This is the first time they ever looked at. And there's a myth out there that everything's great and wonderful, and some of them, we, we don't know what happened. A, a flip, they flipped a switch. They, they just died by suicide, right? This kind of challenged that belief that it's unexplainable, unexpected, and you can't help. The other thing was that 63% of these youth showed warning signs a year up into the death. And again, this is 63%, not all, right? All right, and also, this is one I think it, it is very kind of disturbing, but it points out, they surveyed this group of parents. 90% of parents said, I know my kid. I know if they'll have a problem. And what they really found out is only one third would. We've also learned along the way that how we deal with a death by suicide impacts others. How we portray it, this is the only death that's fairly unique. Depending on how we portray it, how we deal with it, it can have an impact and put others at risk. The more graphic, more violent, more details, um, it can impact others. And we call it a contagion effect or copycat. And this has been primarily research looking at the media. All right? So, and we've come a long way. When I was a kid, you'd read the obituary, the last line was how they died. And it was pretty graphic, okay? I don't see that admitted. Uh, the media has some, there's some guidelines to develop. We try not to put it on the front page. If you do, try to put it below the fold. Try not to put the person's name. Try not to use the word suicide. And put the protective factors. Give the warning signs and where to get help. You know, those kind of things are really important. And part of it is um, when someone dies, we want to honor them, right? And we have well-meaning intentions. So I've spent a lot of time consulting and working with schools on how to address this. What do you do? For example, in this show, they, they, the kids set up a, a spontaneous memorial at Hannah's locker. What were the kids doing? A, it was there. B, they were taking selfies by it and posting them. All right. So those are some of the things. How do you address that? What do you do? Um, one of the things I have here is talking about Whitney's walk. There's a difference um, when you can direct things towards suicide prevention. Right? That makes a difference. You don't get that copycat effect of kids who might be vulnerable. Um, I'm trying to think of, of some of the other things. Uh, part of it, too, it, it is what you tell kids. You know, they did research on when Marilyn Monroe died. It was a, a, a very long time period after that that there were copycat deaths. Right? People copied that. Okay? So part of it is kind of learning how do we handle this? How do we address kids' needs? How do we talk about it without actually uh, jeopardizing someone else? Okay? And then back to my died by suicide. We're changing how we even talk about it, and I think that helps. One thing that I think 13 Reasons does is they romanticize suicide. And we've done this through our stories. I think of Romeo and Juliet. What is the whole premise of that? Young love, they can't be together, so they're going to end it all, right? There's um, some communities uh, 
that, that I've been in. I think this is great. They teach it in high school. How many of you are in here had to read Romeo and Juliet? Memorize it. Romeo, where art thou, right? Um, they, at the end of that, they do it in English class, they bring it into a suicide prevention program. I love it. OK, that's the kind of stuff. I think that's great. Uh, the thing with the show particularly creates a thing that we call a revenge fantasy. And that's kind of scary, right? because it's I'll show you. And when we talk about, we've learned some kid, things about kids and risk factors for suicide. If you have a kid who's impulsive, and they've done some studies on young males. When they're impulsive, they're angry, uh, and they're not <coughs> really rational, right? They will do something, okay? And that fits kind of this I'll show you kind of thing. And what I find when I work with these kids, back to that dog on adolescent brain, it's not fully mature. To them, death is not necessarily permanent. Also, thing too, when we talk about depression, you know, depression is tied to suicide. Depression is what we call the common cold of mental illness. So many people have dealt with it or will deal with it in your life, right? So part of that with educating, one of the symptoms of when you are depressed is that you may not be eating, you may not be sleeping. So how many of you in here had babies at one time? Do you remember getting up with those newborns? Oh my gosh, you're walking around in a cloud. Right? I've had college students say, hey, you can't concentrate, you can't focus. They'll say, hey, I can see the professor writing on the board. I can't read the words. Okay? That was depression. So add that in, that you're not thinking clearly, and then add this brain that's not fully developed, and add some impulsiveness. Right? Um, and also, kids are black and white thinkers. My boyfriend dumped me, the world is over. Those can be kind of put kids at higher risk factors, okay? Um, honest to goodness, I, I talk to kids, work with kids. There were kids that are seriously going to take their life. They have a plan. They're going to do it. They are ready. And then in the next sentence, they say, oh, but I have to go turn in this tomorrow. <laughs> and you say, wait a minute. You won't be here to turn that back in. Oh, right? And so that's a concern. If you have a vulnerable youth watching mm -hmm. this, Hannah is alive throughout the show. She's talking. You see flashbacks of her, right? She's not dead. So that can be kind of <coughs> a challenge. So that's one of the things. You know, so I work with kids, and, and, I, and I'm pretty, I guess, harsh. You won't be sending messages from the brain, you know, from the grave. And then the other thing, you know, with this, she sends these tapes out and makes these threats. You give it to you, and then you, and then if not, this is what's going to happen. You know, I would work with kids, and, and, and a protective factor might be challenging some of this and say, you know what? What if those kids say, I don't care, and they throw them in the garbage? Your message isn't going to get hurt. Is it really worth, you know? So part of it is, is challenging some of that. <coughs> it's a complex issue. I think we need to talk about, you know, when we look at mental illness, there are people dealing with depression, anxiety, mental illness who do not die by suicide. It's not necessarily common. And it's, it's a combination, oftentimes, of treatable mental illness, overwhelming stressors. You know, and there's certain factors, like I've talked about, that will put kids um, youth at risk. Okay. And sometimes, too, it's, it's a matter, oftentimes, a suicidal plan or, or to act on that plan can be in a 24 to 40 hour period or less. Sometimes it's just dumb luck. If you do not provide the means, they can't follow through. Um, one of the things I have parents ask, what can I do for suicide prevention? And I used to carry them around with me. I, I used to have a box of gun locks. I'm from Montana. No one's going to take my gun. I have my gun, right? But there's a thing about if you keep the gun and the, the ammunition separate and locked up, or a gun lock, um, it, it's a challenge. Parents will say, well, even if they do keep them separate, if you have a kid you're worried about, get the means, the pills, the knives, whatever, the ropes, get them out of the house. Give them away for someone else for safekeeping. Because I've had to talk to parents, and the parents will say, and I'll say, this is really difficult. I'm going to tell you about your kid, and, and I'm concerned you have a weapon in the home. Oh, they can't get to it. They don't know where it is, and they don't know where the ammunition is. And I'll say, yeah, they do. It's in the closet, and the bullets are under the bed, and it's in a box, and da, 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 da. Okay? Back to that 90%, right? We think we know our kids. They know more than we think. Okay? All right. And also, when, when adults and youth die by suicide, they are trying to end an intolerable pain. It's an emotional pain. And if you add an internal agitation, go back to that. You're not thinking clearly, you're, you're overwhelmed, and you're agitated. You just want this feeling to stop, right? So we work with kids and we talk about this is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And when I talk about some of the warning factors, I'll talk about when kids get in trouble, they feel like they're a burden or a financial burden because they got in trouble with the law. It's those kind of things you know, that we can talk about with them. Um, another thing, this show, it does reinforce suicide as a solution. 
If someone's isolated, struggling, and vulnerable out there, that concerns me. Okay, that, that this is an answer to your problems. Right? Anytime we talk about suicide, it's really important to have a message of hope and prevention and to let people know there is treatment out there. And if they can't feel hope, if we can give it to them. I know you don't think you're ever going to feel better, right? But there is hope. You can. We can work on this, right? Okay. And lastly, this, this just makes me want to bat my head against the wall. Okay, it shows the adults were not helpful. And the counselors, this is giving counselors and school counselors a bad rap dog on it. And you know what? And the reality is, there are people out there who aren't helpful, right? Back to my message to kids, it takes courage to ask for help. It takes even more courage when you've asked someone and they're an idiot, right? Keep asking. All right. So, so that's concerning because, it, again, one of the things research has found, and I found my own experience working with communities, after a death by suicide of a youth, other kids are not always surprised. But the adults were shocked. Okay. So one of the message out there, I try to teach kids, this, is, this goes back to that code of silence. If you really care, this is the one secret you don't keep. You scream it from the rooftops. And I, I work with kids, and I say, it's okay to have your best friend hate you for the rest of your life because they're alive to do it. It's okay if every time they see you in the hall, they turn and walk the other way. It doesn't matter. They're alive, right? And that's hard. Back to that quote in the relationship. Remember, it's so important to the kids. One of the things um, we talk about, why is it hard for kids to talk to adults? So these are the, some of the responses I get when I explore this with teens. Adults discount what I say. They minimize what I'm feeling. Remember back to that puppy love? Um, or they get angry. How many times have we had discussions, right? I think about my great counseling skills, and all of a sudden I, they tell me something, and I stop listening, and I'm angry, right? Um, as parents, we want to help our kids. We want to make things better. We'll try and fix things. We'll offer solutions, but sometimes we just need to keep listening first, okay? And we'll stop listening and telling them what to do, right? How many of you heard, well, you know, you know what you need to do. When you're upset, or you're kind of on a rant or a vent, it's not, you don't want to hear that, right? Kids don't either. Or kids will say, my parents don't have time. Right? Or they have stresses and problems of their own. They're tired, they're stressed out. I don't want to add to it. We might lose the house. My dad lost his job. I, I don't want to bring this up. So how do I respond? I say, you know what? You're, they're your parent, and it's their job, and you tell them they want to know. Okay. So what do we do? I think we need to use this show as an opportunity to connect you know, with the kids in our life. And partly, to end a conversation with them, I think you need a little bit of background and have some warning signs for suicide and depression. Okay. And you have to be prepared. This could be an uncomfortable conversation, especially if you grew up with the code that we don't talk about this stuff. We don't talk about feelings. We don't talk about mental illness. Right? We don't talk about this. Right. And so there are things you can do. For example, like the QPR training. If you're uncomfortable, by the end of that, you'll be a lot less uncomfortable. Right. So what are some of the warning signs? This is kind of small, but I want to get them all on there. If someone you know are worried about, they're talking about wanting to end their own life, or they're pre there's a preoccupation, the music they're listening to, the shows they're watching, right? Um, if they're looking for a way to hurt themselves. If they're feeling, if they feel hopeless, that's a real concern. Kids are feeling hopeless. They don't feel, when I ask a kid, do you ever think you're going to feel different or better? And they say, no, I'm always going to feel this way. That's a concern. That puts a kid at a higher risk, okay? Talk about being a burden. Increased use of alcohol and drugs. Oftentimes, when I used to do a mental health screen with kids, we would screen for drug and alcohol. And what I would find when these kids are using, it's not because they're bad kids and they're not having a big party and all that, right? They are self-medicating. They're trying to make themselves feel better, and they will try whatever's out there, okay? Or then you get to the point where they're very, back to that agitation, they're restless, they're irritable. One thing about adolescents with depression, who are depressed is different from adults, they're irritable. They're like that soda bottle in it. It explodes all over everybody sometimes, right? That can be depression, all right? And they also may do reckless behavior. They're going to drive really fast. They may take chances. They don't care, right? Sleeping too little, too much, right? No appetite, too much appetite. You know, all these things, withdrawing, being isolated, showing rage, talking about seeking revenge, extreme mood swings, more irritable than usual, not caring about the future. That's one of the things I want to know when I talk to kids. What are your future plans? What do you want to be? Right? They don't have plans. That concerns me. Okay. Um, 
And it's something to a dramatic change in behavior, appearance, thoughts, feelings. And this can work the other way. If you have someone in your life who's suffering from depression, and all of a sudden their mood gets really, really happy and good, that could be a warning sign. Check in with them. Find out where they're at. Because research has found when someone has finally, remember that internal pain and agitation? When someone has finally made a plan to end their life, that reduces that anxiety, and they feel good. Okay. The other thing, giving away prized possessions. So when I work with kids and they talk about, you know, what's so-and-so? What's the one thing you know about him he just loves more than anything else? They say, oh, his guitar. Okay. When Tommy says, here's my guitar, I'm not going to need it anymore. That's when you say, why? Tell me about this. What's going on? If he answers, because my dad just bought me one that Led Zeppelin had, and I don't need any more. Cool. Right? So you want to explore that. So those are the kind of indirect messages kids and people can give off. All right, so these are kind of that when you're feeling unimportant, trapped, homeless, overwhelmed, unmotivated, alone, impulsive, depressed, suicidal, right? So how do we talk about it? Well, ask them if they watched it. We are now into May. This came out the end of March. I would say majority of kids that have already watched it or they read the book, right? If they um, are watching it, ask to watch it with them. Or if they watched it, tell me you want to discuss it um, and you want their thoughts on it. You ask open-ended questions. <coughs> What you think about it? And then you have to be quiet. This is the hardest part. You have to be really be ready to listen. You have to be calm and you can't be judgmental. And this is going to be harder than you think, right? I asked my daughter what she was watching a while back. And when you grow up in mental health, I found out my kids know more about mental health and suicide than I thought, which I guess is a good thing, right? Um, but she said, yeah, I'm watching the show. The kids said we're good. It's called 13 Reasons. And she started watching it. And I said, What's it about? And she said, yeah, mine, you're not going to like it. OK. Could we have ended the conversation because she was afraid to tell me she was watching it? Yeah. If we make a judgment, this should show what this show's bad, you shouldn't be watching it, how dare you? Right? We've already stopped that conversation. You've put up a wall. So you want to know why do you like it? What's good about it? Okay? And if you're concerned or worried about someone, don't be afraid to ask. What is my rule? Talking about suicide's okay. And you don't even have to do a good job talking about it. And if you flub it up, Keep talking. doesn't matter. And if you're not comfortable talking about and asking, get someone else who is. It's okay, right? And then also talk to them. Here's the big one about their friends. These kids carry this burden of worrying about their friends, and they don't know what to do, right? Recently, I just had a, a friend call me. Um, this is from another state, another community. Uh, these, uh, these young adults are out of college. The majority of them, they were on a college team. They all got a group text. Thanks for being there. I want you guys to know I love you and I appreciate you. I'll see you on the other side. What do you do with that? This friend's child, <laughs> adult, called 911. That's what you do. The coach called the parents, which was good too. My recommendation is you call 911, ask them for a safety check, then call the parents. And anyone else you need to, right? But it scared these kids, young adults, witless, right? And talk about with kids breaking the code of silence, you know, and set the groundwork for future conversations. There, oftentimes, you know, kids get in trouble with the law, they're in trouble, they get pregnant, and they think black and white thinking, the world is over. I cannot face my parents. All right, so this is the opportunity to open those conversations. I may not like what you do, I may not agree with it, but I am here with you. And I want you to be here, and we can fix it. It's not going to be easy, I'm going to be really mad at you but I want you to stay here alive to do it, right? You put that out there and warn kids. This is your expectation. Because sometimes we don't talk about these things. If kids are afraid to bother you because you had a bad day and you're stressed out, really? Okay? So it kind of gets us out there. And also, one thing I didn't talk about this show is the connection with sexual assault, date rape, alcohol, and the connection with suicide. You know, I'm not saying cause and effect, but think of all those things, what they can lead to, all right? So who do you go for help? If you're a kid, go to your parent, teacher, principal, coach, pastor. You know, the list is endless. And I have school counselor on there because there are really good school counselors. In fact, we have one right here in the audience and one over here. Where'd she go, right? They care, they're here. I'm telling you, school counselors and counselors in general, they're not doing this job for the money, right? They're doing it because they care, all right? There are hotlines, there's professional counselors, we have behavioral health agencies, behavioral health in hospitals, human service center here in town. Children Home Association of Illinois, okay? We have a suicide hotline. Here is 
741, 741. You can text it. You text the word start. You need to talk to someone. So if someone you think is in danger and you're really concerned for their safety, okay, let them know you care. Don't leave them alone. Keep them safe. All right, we have the Human Service Center. There's a crisis 24-7 walk-in. You're 18 and older. You can call the local. You can take them to the local emergency department. You can call 911. And we have a representative here from the crisis center too, so you can even call them and they will walk you through what to do. All right? So don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. All right? All right. So with that, I'm, I'm going to introduce Corey Campbell. Can you say hi? And we have Brittany Ott here. She's from the Dick, Illinois Addiction Recovery Center. Um, both really great community organizations and resources. <coughs> so what I'd like to do now is, is uh, open this up to questions. Do you have any questions about how to talk about this? And I'm warning you now, when I do this with kids, they have a zillion questions. So come on, don't be outdone by the kids, right? <laughs> Thoughts? Comments? Yeah? I have a, a specific situation currently with my 17-year-old daughter. Well, I want her to be here tonight. Um, everything you spoke about, I'm going through right now. Um, it's overwhelming to me as her mom. And it's we have in place counselors, psychiatric treatment, the school counselors, my church now, and um, just recently she um, posted something on social media. It alarmed her friends. They called me. I was on my way home, and I was so shaken with fear. She had taken all the pills from her cabinet and. They, she was sitting in a daze, and she's already medicated. And it, it's overwhelming us, my, myself. So um, with helping her, parents need help as well to get through the process of it. Absolutely. You know, um, I, I think that's the biggest thing, too. Often, you know, when you're the parent, you don't take care of yourself when you're dealing with these issues, right? And, but Children's Home has been superb. Wonderful. And um, Methodist, um, her school counselor, they're awesome. It's just getting her to the next step of confidence. And so she has demonstrated she's dressing better now. And she's combing her hair again. She cleaned the room up, thank you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> she gained a little weight. So I'm noticing her patterns are starting to be more positive. But it's, it's a lot. Okay. Of work, so. and, and that's something too, you know, I don't, it's, it's not a, um, a magical potion. It doesn't all get better. You know, you can be in for um, some really long, hard work, right? Thank you for sharing. Yes? I have a question. Going from peer to peer, I would recommend that peers address each other if someone comes up to them and says, I really want to confide in you, I'm feeling suicidal, but I have Plan in place. Mm -hmm. How would you suggest that peers talk to each other that way instead of going straight to call 911 or? Right, right. Um, well, you do is you, you kind of sometimes knowing and sharing that, but also to give, um, to make sure that, that the youth hearing this information has someone to go to to say, what do I do with this? Right? I often get called by, by friends and family, and a uh, situation happened with my own daughter. She was captain of the tennis team, and there was something that came out that got group texted. My daughter went got me, and, and so I was coaching under her how to respond on this text, right? This group text. So absolutely, you want to give them the resources to know that you know it's okay. Sometimes kids are venting and sharing, but to say and, and to say I'm really worried about you. We need to tell someone. This is too much, and, and you're scaring me. I, I don't. I don't want this on me. I need some help, right? So and sometimes you know they will hear that from a peer. You know, be there for them. Yes. Um, I'm in education, and suicide has become the hot word with a lot of kids. What do you do in the instance where you feel as though perhaps they're using it for more attention seeking than an actual plan? Well, one of the things I recommend, anytime someone mentions suicide, you take it okay. for reality. It is, you know, what they're saying it, you accept it, but that if they're saying they're going to hurt themselves, you know, because most times, you know, we, there's kind of a myth they believe, oh, you're just talking about trying to get attention. What we've found that most kids really are, you know, when they're doing that. So some kids get dismissed. 
and they really are reaching out for help. I, I think part of it, again, hopefully there's kind of a plan in place. There's someone that can assess. Uh, when I assess kids, you know, I get really intense. I want to know, is this passive ideation? Is it active ideation? How long has it been going on? What's your plan? What's your mean? Do you have access? You know, how many attempts have you had? It, it's like a police interrogation. You know, that's a technique we use now. It's kind of like when you ask to go back to a scene of a crime. Okay, what time and day was it? Where were you? What was in the room? You get a whole lot more information, you know. So I, I think they're, you know, and to be able to be tied into the rest of that support system, to be able to have a release, to call that counselor or that parent and say, we're concerned this happened today at school. And to, I guess, tie into that, um, if you recommend them for a SAS referral and, you know, <coughs> that we have is parents not being involved or not being able to reach, they have to sign off for the SAS referral to continue. So if you can't get that, what would you recommend at that point doing for the child if there's not the parental support? Feedback, Corey? Ideas. So, so you're talking about in a school setting that you have concern. Um, I, I think again, yeah. Corey. Yeah. Well, you run into that intimate danger of harm to self or others, which supersedes confidentiality. Okay. Um, and so that's the that's you know the big gun, right? Yeah. Um, but that's when you're you're at that point where you're fearful that if I let this person out of my sight, something's going to happen. Yeah. And as educators, as social workers, as counselors. We all have that higher level of responsibility. So that's where it starts superseding confidentiality and getting a formal assessment. Okay. So. so they will continue without the parental signature. If there, if that if the determination is made that, okay. that threat is at the level of imminent imminent danger, then yeah. And and hopefully as a teacher you can call in your school counselor, your school social or school psychologist, you know, pull pull the team in. You don't have to deal with them on your own. Yes? Usually when um, a student says something to a teacher or a friend, oftentimes the friend or the teacher will come to us, the counselors, and then we are the ones that work with that student to assess what is happening. And usually when there is a conversation about suicide, 100% of the time we contact home with the student's knowledge and the student understands why we're calling. Um, and then when we call home, the parent then um, typically comes in and we have a conversation about what the next steps are going to be in handling. And, and then we talk about a safety plan as well. That's wonderful. That's great. Yes. <clears throat> I have a, a 13, almost 14 year old son and he has ADHD and Asperger's and he really desires to be social, but he doesn't have very many friends, and his brother and sister are very social, and he doesn't, and they don't have a problem with friends. And I feel like um, he's, we've, he's seen, he has been seeing doctors for years. Um, but I feel like the writing is so on the wall that he's going down this path that this is just something that I just think he gets more and more lonely and distraught and overwhelmed and hopeless. And I, so when you see the writing on the wall that you're fearful that that's the direction that, that, that they're feeling and they're going in, <laughs> you know, you would think you, there's something you can do to stop it. And the other thing is, we haven't seen this movie, and then I wonder, is it, if they don't, if they're not aware of it, do you watch it together, or I, I almost I, feel like keeping them in the dark yes. seems better. I, but I, especially if you have a child who's ever had a suicide attempt, suicide ideation, mental health, and also developmentally. I mean, this show is incredibly graphic and violent, and no, okay. if, if they haven't seen it, I don't really recommend them watching it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, but I think there's plenty of other um, forms of media that can open up this conversation Absolutely. without watching the show. Yeah. Um, just because I, I think it's important to talk about these things um, wholeheartedly, but um, this is not the show to open up that conversation. No, and you know, it's interesting. They, they added some disclaimers, Netflix. There is a season two, which my cynical side said, oh great, one kid, um, something tragic happens to him, either by self or someone else. A kid has a gun, a drawer full of ammunition. What could season two possibly be about, you know? Um, and they, they do a talk afterwards, the producers and Selena Gomez, and saying, you know, we're taking this very seriously. Suicide is never the answer. And gosh, I wish they would have put that at the end of each episode before it ended, like maybe cut it off and then do the ending because uh, I asked some of the kids I know, did you watch it? Yeah, no, I didn't watch that part. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, so. 
You know, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, but absolutely. If you haven't seen it and if they are young, I would not encourage it. Um, because you may have conversations you're, you're not ready for or they're not ready for, especially with the sexual assault and alcohol and all that. Other thoughts, comments? The other thing, too, be, be real careful because, again, you know, you don't want to make a judgment. Bad show, bad person, don't watch it. Right? So you got to be kind of open-minded and say, well, tell me, what you think about it? And when I asked some of the, the teenagers, you know, one was very eloquent and saying, I'm confused. We you say we're supposed to talk about suicide and get it out there. So a show like this comes up, and then everybody's all upset because it's out there. Hmm, that's pretty informed. You know, so let's further that conversation and say, why? We're a little concerned. You know, could they have done a little differently? You know, and their intent was, and I think their belief for the graphicness is that you need it to show how serious and real it is. Unfortunately, again, I think that just helps. You don't want it to be a training manual for someone else to learn from. It. That's the downside of that. Thoughts, comments? You know, and, and it's an opportunity, and you have to decide for your child where they're at developmentally, you know, in their age, and you have to take these opportunities when they come. Um, years ago, my children, again, in the field of mental health, they were in grade school, and there had been a death the previous year in our community by suicide of a young person and they didn't know anything about it you know they were too young well the next year it came out that they were telling me at a certain middle school they had a ghost and of course again maybe I'm a distracted parent I'm driving in the car and I'm like there are no such thing as ghosts there's no ghosts yes there is mom so and so school has a ghost no they don't yes they do and this is why the girl did this because she was pregnant my little brain went oh okay so they got a little bit of that correct I'm thinking, how in the heck, way across town at this elementary school, did these kids hear about this? So what do I do with that? So there are no more ghosts. Buckle your seatbelt. Be quiet. We're going home. <laughs> no. <laughs> Teachable moment. They're like I said, it can be uncomfortable. So I said, oh, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are no ghosts. But yes, there was a girl who died in the school. She died because she was pregnant. And I said, okay, suicide's a complex thing. And so I kind of went into this as best I could for grade school kids talking about awkward and uncomfortable, but then I used it and said, I want you to know, whatever happens, you may get pregnant, you may break the law, you may get in trouble, bad things, you might do something really, really, really bad. I want you, I'm saying right here and now, you come to us and tell us. We will work it out, you may not be happy, but you give us that opportunity. And I had these little kids over, okay, mom. And so what's the little one say? But there really aren't ghosts? No! Okay. <laughs> so take what you can from it and use it. And it is awkward, uncomfortable, and I've been doing this for how many years, right? Yes? Do you feel like I noticed on your slide how kids said it does display the reality of what is really going on in high school and even grade school? Do you feel like talking to parents that they were shocked at what actually is happening in the schools and the emotional aspect of the teens? Because I feel like some parents don't think that that is what's going on. Well, it goes back to that myth. Your kid, life is fun. What do you have? You know, when, when we talk about some of the things kids are doing, you know, the, the, the prescription pills they steal and they throw in a big punch bowl and everybody grabs a handful. Um, I, I lived in Wisconsin for a while. The kids were doing a game called the choking game. Where they choke each other to the point where you pass out. Okay, again, I, I talk to kids about that young brain, and I say, listen, if we are both at a baseball game tonight and I get hit by lightning, and you get hit by lightning, whose brain is going to hopefully repair quicker? Well, it's called plasticity, a young brain. So that's a great thing. By that same token, I said, if we're under the bleachers doing drugs and drinking, whose brain is going to do better? It's not good for either of us, but whose brain is going to be more impacted? The young brain. It's not fully developed. You know, so it, it's some of those conversations to let parents know what's going on. And, and there's a real tie, you know, and, and something when we talk about bullying, I talk, I'm an advocate of bystander training. I do this with college students when I do the drug and alcohol talks. <coughs> and I talk to them about what to do when you're drinking and what to do when you're out with your friends and how you intervene in a safe way to stop a bullying or stop a sexual assault because people have been drinking. Can you distract them? Can you use humor? How do you get your friend out of there? You know, in this situation, this girl was left in a hot tub alone. Don't leave your friends alone. I don't care how cute the other guys are or girls or whatever, right? Same thing goes with the date rate drugs. You can't smell them, you can't see them, you can't taste them, right? So I talk to college kids and I say, I don't care. And we're gonna assume they're all of age, yeah. I don't care how much that tutti fruity, really fancy cool drink with a big umbrella cost. You walk away to go to the bathroom or you turn your back to go look at somebody, it's gone. 
You bring your own alcohol, you open your own alcohol, you do not take a solo cup from somebody. You know, it's those kind of things. I think we need to educate. When I work with college kids, and I used to do this alcohol 101 when they got in trouble for drinking, and I'll get on there and say, if I preach at them, I've lost them. And I'll say, I'm not here to preach, but there are two things I do get preachy about with them. I want them to know the signs of alcohol poisoning, right? Look what's going on in the news right now, Penn State. Okay, that you do not leave your friend. College kids have this perception, if you are passed out and I got you back to your dorm bed, we're good. You're absolutely not good. That's alcohol poisoning. Your little body is shut down. And when you do that, you lose the ability to control vomiting. You're going to aspirate. You do not leave your friend. You keep them on the side or you go get them help. You know, and some of these kids, when I do this training, I will have them write on the board what their blood alcohol content was when they got written up. And some of these alcohol, and then we list them all. And then I go through what happens to your body. And I talk about, guys, at this stage, guess what? You can no longer perform sexually. But at this stage, you might wet your pants. Pretty, pretty exciting, isn't that? And then I'll say, at this stage, you no longer know you're drinking. Your body can't tell you to stop. And you might be making out with a bush. So again, by standard training, look out for your friends. And then I get to the point where you get to a certain point and you, and Brittany, you can respond to this, alcohol training, um, you are legally what you would do if you went in to have surgery and be anesthetized. Next step's coma and death. Some of these kids, their blood alcohol content, they went into the hospital for alcohol poisoning. I'm amazed they're functioning. All right, we talk about body weight, size, and all that kind of stuff impacts it. But wow, it's scary, right? So you try to portray it in a way to teach these kids what to do and what to do with your friends and how to protect your friends. So, you know, yeah, we do what we can, and it doesn't always work, right? Even knowing all the best information, people will still die by suicide. And it's not a judgment, right? People do everything they can. And they weren't. So I, I think, you know, the fact that we talk, maybe we can make a difference and help someone else. And sometimes you don't know what the interaction, what that can do down the road with kids. When we did this screen, we had a kid come back once and he became our spokesperson, went on to college, went into the field of psychology. We happened, it was a screen I was involved in in Wisconsin. We'd randomly, the kids gave permission, parents gave permission, we'd randomly pull them down out of class. And we had so many kids, we'd just randomly do it, right? We caught this kid on one day. He had some mental health issues, we got him help, it was not an easy fix, it was a long road, very long road, but he made it. And he came back and was a spokesperson for us, and he wrote when we asked for feedback, if you had not caught me on that day, I wouldn't be here. So it was just dumb luck that we happened to pull his name down that day, right? So sometimes, and sometimes too, when you're reaching out to people, you're planting a seed, right? It may not take effect now, but you never know when it will. You know, and some parents do talk with kids and say, who can you call if you get in a situation? If you, and I talk to my kids and say, if you can't talk to me, give me a list of adults you can talk to. Who else could you go to if you don't want to come to me? I don't care who you go to. Go to somebody. You know? Other questions, comments? You guys are a great audience. Okay. Thank you.